Alhamdulillah 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 Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'firuhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natabakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min tururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lahu ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله الذي أرسل إلى الناس كافة وإلى الخلق عامة بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة قال الله تبارك وتعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وانعم وجد وتفضل وبارك على سيد السادات وافضل الموجودات واشرف الموجودات واحسن الموجودات واكرم الموجودات واجمل الموجودات وأكمل الموجودات سيدنا ومولانا محمد رسول الله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى جميع ملائك المعصومين وعلى جميع عباد الصالحين لقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كلامه القديم العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تلك الرسل فضلنا بعضهم على بعض منهم من كلم الله ورفع بعضهم درجات صدق الله مولانا العظيم وبلغ رسوله النبي الحبيب الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين My dear brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I would like to recall to your minds that I told you on the occasion of my first lecture here which was delivered on the first part of the islamic kalima la ilaha illallah that i shall speak on the other part of the kalima as to what is the implication of the other part of the kalima namely muhammadur rasulullah sallallahu taala alaihi wasallam and this lecture of mine had been fixed for this evening and consequently i am here to fulfill my promise before i start expounding this theme who is the holy prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam what is his status what is his personality what is the nature of his personality and all the allied questions i wish to emphasize that this problem is infinitely more complicated and difficult than the problem of la ilaha illallah and although even the that part of the kalima la ilaha illallah has not been understood by many people properly 
during the course of Islamic history, as I pointed out that day. There are numerous types of confusions which are arising, especially in this age of the impact of materialism on the Muslims, and different groups are arising with their own interpretations of Muhammad Rasulullah. I don't blame them. I do not stand for condemning this group as a mushrik and that group as a kafir and that group as this and that group as that. I don't believe in all this. Because I realize as a very humble student, as a very humble pursuer of knowledge, that knowledge has different levels. Everybody's level of knowledge is not the same whether he may be called a alim deen or he may be called anything else. The comprehension of the facts through knowledge varies from person to person. And these confusions arise only because those who come forward to understand the problem try to view it with all their subjective limitations. Don't say that they are dishonest. Even those who say that the Holy Prophet Muhammad is just like our elder brother, don't say they are dishonest. They can only look thus far and no further. They are not dishonest. Nobody would like to be. It is a matter of faith. Remember. But as Akbar Ilahabadi said, Bole Mansur, about, he said about the human being, the status of the human being also has been in question throughout the ages. So Akbar Ilahabadi says, Bole Mansur ke khudahu mein or Darwin Bole Buznahu Mai. Mansur said that I am God, and Darwin said I am a monkey. Sunkar is ko ye bole mere dost. When my friend heard these two opinions, he said, Fikre Harkas Bakadir Himmati. Everybody thinks according to his understanding. Everybody evaluates things according to his under, understanding. So neither poor Mansur nor poor Darwin are to be blamed. That were their visions, you see, as they, as they saw him. Of course, there is such a level in the realm of knowledge as we are taught in philosophy, a level to which my friend Mr. Mullah that they referred at the Orient Club or Orient High School, what was the level of objectivity. It is not that all knowledge is relative, and if all knowledge is like that, and if everybody's knowledge is like that, and if every interpretation is like that, then there can be no belief and no faith. You cannot arrive anywhere. There is also a standard whereby the different opinions have got to be judged of course, the people are to be forgiven who fall short, because that was their limitation. We should not make these things as the ground for fighting and theological bickerings. Not at all. Thus you will find that about the Holy Prophet والسلام, you will hear opinions. I have learned that you have heard, been hearing here lecturers who have been talking all sorts of things about him which many of you considered derogatory. They talk like that in my country also. But those who had the knowledge of the higher order and hear the knowledge of the lower and the higher order, I may explain further. You see, there is a book. And there is a person who only understands the alphabets in which that book is written. 
Suppose the book is in English language or in Urdu language or in Gujarati or any other language. This person has also got knowledge of the book to the extent that he understands, he knows what is the alphabet in which it is written. That is the measure of his knowledge about the book. Then there is another person who does not only know the alphabet in which that book has been written, but also has a rudimentary knowledge of the language in which that book has been written. For instance, he may be able to translate those passages at a higher level. Then there is a third person who does not only know the alphabet as also the language, but also knows the subject on which that book has been written. His understanding of the book will be higher than of the previous two. Then there is another person who not only knows the alphabet and the language and the subject, but he also knows the interrelated subjects, the background of that subject. His knowledge will be higher than, all the, than the knowledge of all those three. And so it goes on. A person views a landscape from the foot of a hill. Another person goes a few yards above. A third one goes further up. A fourth one goes further up. And a fifth one goes and stands at the peak of the mountain. The view which this person has of the landscape who is standing at the foot of the hill. You cannot say that he is speaking lies. The poor fellow can see just that which, which he can see from the foot of the hill. The person who has gone a bit higher but is lower than the third person who is still higher, don't say that he is a liar. He is just seeing that much as he can see. Understand this, please. I am not giving my talk tonight to make you fight against one another, please. I want to be honest, I am standing in the mosque of Allah and I have to render account on the day of judgment. This is not for mystery. I know, unfortunately, there are men among our ulama who talk for the sake of mystery. I am not a professional alim, I am not a professional peer. Remember this always. And I don't belong to any group. I belong only to one group and that is Islam, the group of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Islam. No, no other group. But I must be honest to myself. And now that my age is beyond 56, and I have been a student from the age of four years, four months, four days, naturally it has been 50 years that I have been in the field of knowledge. And I have devoted this entire life, all these fifty years, half a century, only to the understanding of Islam. So, the very humble information that has come to me, or the very humble knowledge that I have acquired, I consider it my duty to impart it to others, and I am doing it only from that point of view. From no other point of view, not the least from any polemical point of view. I never enter into politics. My career is open and everybody knows. I have been in so many countries of the world, I have never entered into politics at all from the very beginning of my life. But it is a fact, as I told you, that everybody comprehends things according to the, his standpoint, his capacities of perception and conception and comprehension. So. Why you will find people saying like this? What? The Holy Prophet Muhammad Ali was just a mortal like us. And there it ends. You will find such intellectual giants as the late Sir Muhammad Iqbal. Saying what? I'll tell you what he said. He is an intellectual giant, incomparable in this 20th century. And as a poet of Islam, incomparable with anyone before him. 
excluding only Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi. He says about the Holy Prophet Ali Salatu of course he has said at uh, hundred, not hundred but thousands of places in his divans, in his books. He says, Vodana e subul khatmur rusul maula e kul jisne gubare rah ko bakshah faroge wadiye sina nigahe ishq o masti mein wohi awwal wohi akhir wohi quran wohi furqa wohi yaseen wohi taha what a beauty he says that possessor of the knowledge of the paths of guidance, that terminator of the office of divine messengership, that leader of all creation, Maula Ekul, the leader of all creation, Jisne who? Ubare Rah ko baksha faroge wadiye sina who illumined the sands below the feet of the caravan of his followers into the illumined soil of Sinai which was illumined at the time of the Holy Prophet Moses. Then he says Nigahe Ishko Mastime from the point of view of love and approach to the problem in depth, the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, it is he who is the first and it is he who is the last. And it is he who is the Quran. And it is he who is the a standard of right and wrong in this entire universe. Wahi Quran, Wahi Furqan, Wahi Yaseen, Wahi Taha. And it is he who is Yaseen, that unknowable name given to him by God out of sheer love. You don't know what Yaseen means. I don't know. Nobody knows. That is the secret of love between him and God. And Taha also you don't know and I don't know and nobody knows what the word Taha connotes. It is the talk of love between the lover and the beloved. Or another great man says, Udhar, Udhar Allah se vasil. Idhar makhluk me shamil. Udhar Allah se vasil. Idhar makhluk me shamil. Khawas us barzakhe kubramita harfe mushaddad ka. You know, when you write a word with tashdeed, and there comes the letter on which there is a tashdeed, then the letter is read twice. Mushaddad. Here the dal, which comes after she, has got tashdeed. So it is joined with the previous letter on the one side and with the following letter on the, on the other. This is called tashdeed. Fikre har kasba qadr Everybody gives the verdict according to his or Ginan of comprehension and the level of his understanding and knowledge. All right. These people say this. And remember this fact which I told you. It's a very, very patent fact about the gradations in knowledge. Now, what does the Holy Quran say about the Holy Prophet Ali The Holy Quran is the book about which there can be no two opinions. The Holy Quran has remained intact from the time of the Holy Prophet Ali up to this day. 
without the change of a dot or a dash. About the hadith, a person can say that I don't accept this hadith on certain grounds which may be flimsy or which, which, which may be valid. But about any verse of the Quran, nobody can say it. I'll speak on the life, on the, on, not on the life, mind you, on the personality of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam from the Quran. Now, to begin with, the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam has a double status. Has a double status according to the Quran. The one aspect of his personality is cosmic. The other aspect is mundane. The Holy Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Prophet alayka salatu wa salam, I have not sent you but as a mercy to all the world. All the worlds, when you go beyond the earth, when you go beyond humanity, you are on the cosmic level. This is called the cosmic level, the level of the cosmos. He is a mercy for the entire cosmos. That is his status, the cosmic status. His mundane status is, as the Quran says, initially, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِسْلُكُمْ O Prophet alayka salatu wa salam proclaim that I am a human being as you are human beings. I am giving just one from uh, both sides. I'll, I, I'll come to both these aspects later on in my talk. Now here many people have stumbled on this verse. This verse, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِسْلُكُمْ can be translated in two ways. Remember this. One is the way of kufr and the other is the way of iman. It has been translated by some as meaning, I am a human being like you. This is the translation on the basis of kufr. It leads the person straight to kufr. If anybody says that the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam is a human being like us, like X, Y or Z, he is a kafir. He is speaking the greatest falsehood against the Quran and against the Hadith. No human being is like the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. And what do they mean when they translate it in, so, in, in this ugly fashion? What do they mean? Like whom? Like the robber, the adulterer, the murderer, the devil incarnate in among the human beings, are human beings of all types. Like whom? There's a most foolish idea to translate it like this. Like whom? Who is that standard person bearing the standard of piety with whom we are going to liken him if we say that the Prophet ﷺ is like us? Only that he is our elder brother. What? As the Jews conceived God to be only a magnified human being and nothing more. Can you conceive the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam as just like you, a little better than what you are? Certainly not. The verse says, actually, the connotation of the verse is to emphasize the humanity of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam in order that Muslims may not fall a prey as others had fallen prey in view of the great qualities of the Holy Prophet and in view of those miraculous powers that he had been given 
they may not fall a prey to the misconception that he is not a uh, human being, but he is God in some sense of the word. It is his divinity which is being emphatically denied here. Not that he is like us. Who can be like him? Again, all right. He is a human being. We are human beings. Certainly. Those who have studied physics and chemistry and so on, those who have studied physical sciences, they know that charcoal is pure carbon. And the diamond is also pure carbon. The charcoal is pure carbon. It is only the frequency of the molecules of the electronic particles of the diamond that makes it a diamond and it is only the frequency of the par basic particles of which charcoal is, is made. The difference lies only in frequency according to the latest knowledge in the field of science. Otherwise, basically both are pure carbon. I say, standing here, the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam is human being. I am a human being. I am like charcoal and he is like diamond. And here the matter is settled. Would anyone like to exchange his diamond, it may be of just half a carat, with a hundred wagons load of charcoal? No. The charcoal and the diamond, although being basically the same, their laws of existence are different. Their value and worth is different. Their external appearance itself is different because charcoal is black and opaque. The diamond glitters and shines. If a person eats charcoal, it is good for gases in the stomach. The doctors prescribe the U carbon, you see, you might get the tablet in the mask. It's all grounded charcoal only. If a person eats diamond, he will be killed outright. Opposite property. And, and the distance in point of worth and value between them is so to say, infinite. The value of the diamond and the value of the charcoal. One carat of charcoal and one carat of diamond, weigh them together and then see what is the difference in their value. So, although the charcoal and the diamond both are carbon, there is a world of difference between the two. And although me and you and the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, we here and he there, both are human beings, but there is a world of difference between us and, and him in point of status, in point of the constitution of his personality and his powers. What are the childish things which people talk? Very sad. Now, as regards his cosmic status, as I told you that he has two types of status, according to the Quran, the cosmic status and the mundane status. A status with reference to the cosmos and a status with reference to, the, to this mundane world, this spatial uh, temporal world where we live. All right. Let us walk on the ground. Let us view the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu status only from the point of view of this mundane world. 
I have dealt with the with one verse of the Quran, "Qul inna ma ana bashar al-muslu." Now try to find out and try to understand his status as a divine messenger. According to the Holy Quran, "Lekul lekau min hal." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent His messengers to every community of the world. From the time of Adam to the time of the Holy Prophet, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. All right. How does Allah deal with all these messengers, and how does Allah deal? Does Allah deal differently with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? I'll tell you, He does. No prophet can stand comparison with Him in point of His status. I'll tell you from the Quran, and it is not a matter of inter. Protection, mind you, it is just a statement of fact. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Maulana Muhammadin wa ala Ali Sayyidina wa Maulana Muhammadin wa Baris. Adam was a prophet. Noah was a prophet. Abraham was a prophet. Moses was a prophet. Jesus was a prophet, according to the Quran. All right. Read the entire Quran. What do you find? When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala addresses any of these messengers, from Adam right down to the Holy Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be on him, He always calls them by their name, and He has not called the Holy Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam by his name even once in the whole Quran. Is it meaningless? Can this fact be meaningless? Can you attribute any meaninglessness to God's wisdom? Remember this: it is not just by chance. It is not just by chance. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants to demonstrate. The grandeur of the position of the Holy Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and wants to demonstrate the relation of the Holy Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, the special relation of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam with him. I ask you, even a child among you can understand this point. Why? Do we not call a person by his name when we don't do so? What hinders us from doing it? There can be only two reasons. Only two reasons: either intense love or intense respect. We won't call. A cultured man, at least, will not call his father by his name. Oh, so and so, come here. Never. This is because of love. Uh, I mean, because of respect. And the people may give an Islamic name to their children. Of course, they give at the time of Akika. They may call him Ismail or Hasan or anything. But they also give a name, a pet name or a name on the basis of affection. And the child is called inside the home by that other name, not by that name which was given at the time of Hafiz. Isn't that so? So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has demonstrated thereby that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala loves him intensely, and therefore He does not want to. Address him in the same manner as he addressed the other prophets of God. This is clear. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants the Muslims to honor him. He is showing to them that I am not calling him by his name. I am teaching you that you should honor him. And remember, remember. He has said, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has said in the Holy Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O believers, 
لا ترفع اصواتكم فوق صوت النبي do not raise your voices above the voice above the pitch of the voice of the holy prophet alayhi salatu wala tajharu lahu bil qawl kajar baadikum le baad and do not talk to him in the fashion in you talk among yourselves and tahbata amalukum if you do even this slight unconscious mistake remember all your namaz all your prayers and fasting and charity and everything will be annulled complete what is this status what is this status you can forgive any insult done to you you will never forgive any insult which anybody does to your beloved this is the law of love this is the law of love that you can forgive an insult which is done to you but you will never tolerate any insult to your beloved allah subhanahu wa taala has prepared a hundred times to forgive any insults done to him but the slightest insult done to his beloved prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam he says all your virtues tabata amalukum all your virtues will be annulled just at this small point wa antum la tashurun of course you cannot recognize that all this treasure of virtue which you had earned all your life has gone has gone to dogs beware beware the great arifin those who rose to spiritual eminence they say adab gahes adab gahes zere aasma az arsh na zuktar there is a place where respect has to be offered that place is more delicate than the arsh of god nafas gum kar da mi ayad junaydo ba yazidin da here when great spiritual luminaries from among his followers like junayd and ba yazid when they come to the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam they come trembling what are muslims being taught they have lost the source of grace and they feel that they can get grace from god the source of grace established by god is only the personality of the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam there is no other source of grace i'll give it to you from the quran one thing mark this point on in the mundane sphere the different divine messengers came and you know all divine messengers are in the highest category of human beings that every muslim knows that the highest category among human beings is that of anbiya and mursalin of the divine messenger and among these high this highest category the prophet alayhi salatu wassalam has been distinguished in what fashion again at certain places he has been addressed as ya ayyuhan nabi ya ayyuhar rasul o prophet and o messenger these titles are in respect of his function but now from this legal level you see from this formal level allah subhanahu wa taala addresses him from another level there is a transfer of levels he says ya ayyuhal muzammil o thou who are wrapped up in thy mantle ya ayyuhal mudassir here also you can understand the meaning 
Hmm? This is one level higher. This is this shows the intimacy. This shows the intimacy of friendship. The rise from the level of Ya Yuhan Nabi and Ya Yuhar Rasul is Ya Yuhal Muzammil and Ya Yuhal Muddat. There is a further rise. Yaseen wal Quran e Hakim. Hello? So what is the meaning of this word Yaseen? We could understand the meaning of Al Muzammil and we could understand the meaning of Al Muddat. Here. Parda bavarda hai niha parda nashi ka rajesh. Love has curtains which cannot be penetrated by the outsiders. Love does not admit it. It is the nature of love that is it does not admit probe from any outsider. That is the third level. Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim. I swear by the, the Quran, the book of wisdom, inna kala min al mursaleen, verily thou art definitely from among my messengers. But what is the meaning of Yasin? It is a mystery between the lover and the beloved. Then he is addressed as Taha. What is the meaning of Taha? It will not help us as the commentators have said, these are huruf muqattaat. <laughs> this is begging the question. Huruf muqattaat, to call them huruf muqattaat does not explain anything. And they also say, honestly, they say, nobody should try to probe into the meaning of this. God alone knows. Or his, or his beloved Prophet knows. But we can realize from what comes after Taha. Taha. مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْخَى إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى We can understand that this Taha must be an epithet of love because some message of love is being given after that O beloved Prophet alayka salatu wa salam I have not sent on thee the Qur'an to put thee to hardship مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْخَى This is the talk of love and naturally, we can infer only one thing from it, that Taha is an epithet unknown to us, but an epithet of love from God to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Ali. This is his place among the prophets, the highest among you. Further, I'll give you another point. Not only is the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam Venerable and honorable, but the soil on which he walks becomes honorable. The Quran says this, not I. The Quran says, لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that I swear by this city. Not because this city of Makkah contains the Kaaba. No. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath or swears by anything, it means according to the commentators of the Quran, uh, raising that thing in the estimation of the people. For honoring that thing for emphasizing its importance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La uqsimu bihaz al-balad I swear by this city, the city of Mecca. And people might think, as the people now preach, many, many priests nowadays, Muslims, Kaaba is superior to the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. You go to Kaaba, don't go to Medina. Otherwise, you will become a mushrik. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear. He says, I swear and I exalt, I bestow honor on the city of Makkah, not because the Kaaba is there, 
Therefore, I honor. This is the Quran. Not only is the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam venerable, even those particles of dust which touch the soles of his shoes become venerable. And who is saying this? Not a human being. This is being said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by God Almighty. I come back to his cosmic status. I refer you to the verse, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ I now refer you to another verse qad ja'akum min allah nur wa kitab mubin verily there has come unto you the nur and the book which is clear in its exposition of guides the bow here is the bow of us of conjunction this nur is something different the kitab mubin is something different. There are two things about which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Of course, I know that there is a difference of opinion among the commentators. Some of them say that the word nur or light refers here to the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. Others say that it does not. It refers only to the, to the guidance which he brought. Here again the same problem comes in fikre harkat wa qadr himmat us but the holy prophet alayhi salatu was salam was commissioned by god to explain every intricate verse of the quran the holy quran says o prophet alayhi salatu was salam we have i have commissioned thee god almighty says says to expound or and explain and to make clear clarify that which has been revealed in the book latubayyana linnas ma nuzila ilaihim and here comes in hadith as the authority so it is not for us to indulge in any intellectual gymnastic for understanding as to what is the reference to the word nur here it is our duty to go to the holy prophet alayhi salatu wassalam and ask him sir the word nur here qad ja'akum min allah nurun what does it to whom does it refer and to what does it refer? there is, there is a hadith in the sahih Quoted by Maulana Shavali Thanvi, one of the very eminent ulama of the Oban, in his Nashru Teeb Fi Zikril Habib, a, a book of his on the life of the Holy Prophet, Salatu Wassalam. And of course found in the books of the Siha, narrated by Sayyidina Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari, one of the companions of the Holy Prophet, Salatu Wassalam. This companion of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam says that I, I asked the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam as to what was that first thing which God created in his creation. And he says that the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, O Jabir, the first thing which God created in his entire creation was the nur of thine Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. This hadith in this siha compels us 
to side with those commentators who say that qadja akum min allah nur means that allah subhanahu wa taala is definitely referring here only to the holy prophet muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is nur i am going to speak inshallah at mr timol's place on on sunday and i'll speak on this theory of light in connection with creation and the theory of nur e muhammadi there if i take up all problems here i don't think i'll be able to finish even by 12 o'clock there are numerous problems now <coughs> but i should say here i should say here that it has been the consensus of belief among the muslims which was challenged only during this period of muslim decay and degeneration under the impact of modern materialism not before that that the holy prophet alayhi salatu was salam is the center of creation that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the light of the holy prophet alayhi salatu was salam and from that light as given in the full hadith he created everything of this universe the hadith you might have heard from the wazin of course now i understand that those wazin are dead and gone who used to teach this hadith ana min nur allah wal khalq kulluhum min nuri the holy prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said that i am from the light of god remember that the mean here is sababiya i am here i am because of the light of god not a part of the light of god because god himself is indivisible so the mean here according to the arabic language is that which is called sababiya min sababiya it means that i am because of the light of god and the entire universe is has come from my light this is another level this is another verse of the quran which deals with the cosmic personality of the holy prophet alayhi salatu wasalam i wish i i could have spoken on this what i have to speak at mr timol's place right here but because of uh, lack of time want of time at this moment i think i should not take it because it will take about half an hour no no you don't mind you see but i have to i have to finish uh, all the all the various points now all right we will see at the end that the holy prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is the first creature of god has been mentioned clearly in the holy quran i read out to you a verse i mean to those people who say that uh, there is it is questionable whether that hadith is really acceptable or not we are going into realms of metaphysics you see and it is there is all danger of our becoming mushrik and bidati and this and that you see so in order to have the ihtiyat to be very cautious keep off with this hadith this is their attitude nowadays i personally believe that anything which has been explicitly affirmed by the holy quran no muslim has a right to evade it because allah subhanahu wa taala knows those dangers better than we know and the quran is the word of god and this one this one thing that allah subhanahu wa taala created as the first thing in his entire creation the holy prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam this one thing alone has far reaching implications you may ask me where has the quran said 
Even ulama have come to me. They said, the Quran never says this. I said, my dear brothers, try to give some time to the Quran. The time that you give for others. There is a verse in the Quran. There are two verses in the, in the, in the, in the Quran which clarify this point and affirm it beyond the shadow of any doubt. One verse is, Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen la sharika lah wa bithalika umirtu wa ana awwalul muslimin the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam has asked in this verse, he has been asked in this verse to proclaim certain things at the end of which to proclaim ana awwalul muslimin I am the first among the Muslims what does the word Muslim mean? South African Muslims or Pakistani Muslims or Turkish Muslims? Barelvi Muslims or Diobandi Muslims or Wahhabi Muslims? Allahu Akbar! The word Muslim, when the Quran uses it, it does not use in the same connotation in which it has now come into misuse or disuse. Here everybody is called a Muslim, whoever is born of Muslim parents, as I said there at the Orient Club that night, that we are Muslims by accident. <laughs> when the Holy Quran uses this word, then he uses this word in the genuine sense of it. Muslim means he or she who submits himself or herself entirely to the will of God. He is a Muslim or she is a Muslim. Now read another verse. Walahu aslama man fis samawate wala Everything in the heavenly bodies and the earth, that is everything in this universe is Muslim. Combine the two verses. Combine the two verses. When the, this verse asks the Holy Prophet والسلام, to proclaim Ana Awalul Muslimin, then he is before the sun and before the moon and before the earth and before all these heavenly bodies, before everything which is there in creation, because everything in creation is Muslim. And he is the Awalul Muslimin. So it is proved from the Quran what has been said in the Hadith and accepted by the Muslims for 1400 years and being challenged only by a few only now that the Holy Prophet والسلام, was the first to be created by God according to the Quran. Because he is the first to have been created by God. There is no other thing in this universe which is nearer to God than Him. And there is nothing in this universe which can approach God but through Him. He stands there. Come through proper channel. That is clear. I mean, see, it has been clarified at other places in the Quran, but this is something absolutely clear. He is the nearest to God. Udhar Allah se wasil. Idhar makhluk mein shamil. The entire universe, everything in creation has come after him and through him. When the entire creation has come after him and through him, now anyone in this creation who wants to approach God must approach through him. It is very simple logic. It is something very simple. And this has been explicitly told to us. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is almighty. There is a doubt which arises in the minds of people. They say, what need has Allah to make the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu as the intermediary, as the intermediary between himself and his creation? Allah has no need. He has no need for anything. He is as -samad. He is the absolute. He does not depend on anything. He has absolutely no need from anybody. He is self-existent and self-subsistent. But this is how he has made this universe. He has made inter intermediaries, according to the Quran, the angels who are his divine functionaries. He co governs and controls this universe, everything here, through his angels. Why not directly? Does the existence of the angels prove that there is something wrong with the almightiness of God? This never comes to your mind. But when it is said that the Holy Prophet Muhammad is intermediary, some people become ferocious and they say, you are committing shirk. The shirk is not committed when you believe in the angels. It is only when something is said about the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam which elevates him above all creation, then you, then you feel angry. Is there anything wrong with your faith? Take care. You are not angry when the angels are told, you are told that they are intermediaries. You become angry only at the name of the Holy Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. What is wrong with you? And the Quran is very clear that the wasila between creation and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. For instance, we are told, Walau annahum is zalamu anfusahum jauka fastaghfirullah wastaghfir lahum ar rasul lawajadullah tabab ar rasul if these people who transgress the divine laws and damage their personalities if they come to be o oh, Muhammad alayka salatu If they come to thee, Jauka, and after coming to thee, they seek the pardon of God for their sins, and thou also seek pardon of God for them, Lavajadullah tawab rahima, then most surely the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will act towards them with forgiveness and mercy. What is the need here? There is a Quran. There is no question of any interpretation here. Absolutely not. This clear translation does not. The, is not the Quran making the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu as wasila? And was this verse meant only for the companions of the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu as Just as people now feel nowadays that Islam came only for the rich. Because it is only the rich who can perform the Hajj and get all their sins that they uh, do during the year washed off. It has not come for the poor people because the poor people can't go. 